If you have your Bible, let's turn quickly to the word of God found in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 13. The book of Hebrews chapter 6. If, if you see all these individuals standing, they're, they're not walking out. They're, getting, they're not getting ready to leave. They stand out of respect for God's word. Uh, it's something that we've gotten away from since we've been on quarantine, but now we're getting back. Let's get back to doing what we would traditionally do to stand for the word of God. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 13 down to verse 19. Quite a bit of reading, but I promise you the message won't be that long. Amen? Amen. When God made his promise to Abraham, I'm reading out an NIV translation of the Bible. When God made his promise to Abraham, <clears throat> since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so... After waiting patiently, ah, Abraham received what God had promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and an oath, an oath confirms what is said, and it puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm, and secure. I'm going to stop right there. Drop back to verse 17. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. Now listen, I, I'm right in the middle of a series called Grace for Impact. Grace for Impact. And this is our second installment of this conversation that we're having about how we can be more impactful in our families, in our community, and in this city. And so many of the things I'm going to be talking to you about today are building on the conversation that we started on last week. Last week, we talked about the impact of communication, how important it is that we communicate the love of God to a dying world. Y'all remember that? How important it is that we become vessels or instruments that God can use to, through our speaking and through our actions. Amen? So today I want to talk about the impact of commitment. All right? The impact of commitment. Let's pray and then we get into the word of God. All right? Father, bless your word today. We honor you. We respect you. We bow in our spirits before you and ask that you would speak your holy word to us. And if you speak to us, God, our lives will be changed. Our lives will be impacted. Our lives will begin to transform into that which you have called us to be. You said, Lord, that man shall not live by bread alone. We don't live by entertainment, Lord. We don't live by people's talents or giftings. But we live by your word. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The impact of commitment. To have an impact, let me just define from last week what we talked about. To have an impact means to have a sudden powerful effect on something. Uh, I like to say it this way. It means seeing what needs to get done and then taking the initiative to do it. You can't be impactful being a bystander. You got to do something about it. I've said this plenty of times, and I'm going to say it again here. I think it's worth bearing out that there are three types of people in the world. Those who watch things happen, those who make things happen, and those who sit around and they wonder what happened. And if you're going to have an impact on the world, you can't be somebody who sits around and watch things happen. Things are happening all around you, in your church, in your community, in politics, and all you are is a spectator sitting around watching things happen. Nor can you be somebody who is so disengaged and disconnected that every time you come around, you're asking people, well, what happened? Because you weren't there. You weren't available. You always have to get information second, third, and fourth hand. You, 
You always got to find out through the grapevine what happened because you were so disconnected and disengaged and disinformed and maybe disinterested that your very presence does nothing for us because you only show up and ask, what happened? But we are of that third category of people because we are make it happen people. We're involved. We're engaged. That's why we're teaching about impact. Because we're a people who made up our minds that we're going to be world changers and that we're not going to sit back and watch things happen and wonder what happened, but we're going to make things happen. Somebody shout, make it happen. And this happens as we do it, as we, we are going to do this through the strength of our commitments. That's how we're going to make an impact. Through the strength of our commitments. Let me say this to you. I, I, read, I read this quote, and I thought it was very apropos here. Steve Jobs said this. He said, the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are usually the ones who do. The people that think they can, the people that think they can make a difference, the people that, can think, that think they can change their community, their city, their families, the people who are just crazy enough to think that they can make a difference, they're normally the ones who do. It's not the critics, not the bystanders, it's not those people who sit around and have something to critique what you do, but it's actually people who commit to something, put their hand to the plow, and do something about it. They have the fortitude, the infernal fortitude, to find some worthy cause, and they get involved. You with me so far? One of the great, so I'm going to go for it. One of the great attributes of God is that he is a covenant-keeping God. He keeps his word. And if we're going to make a difference, we're going to have to be people who learn to keep our word. If we're going to take on his nature and become the children of God he's called us to be, we have to act like our daddy and be somebody who when we say something, we do it. A man or a woman is only as good as their word. When you don't keep your word, it damages your brand, it damages your reputation. I was speaking to the men on last Tuesday, and I was talking to them about the importance of protecting your personal brand. Your personal brand is your reputation. It's what you're known for. It's your name in the streets. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. If, if your name is good enough, you don't even need money. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got three, four, five. If, if your name is good enough, you don't need money. They will give you things on the strength of your name. God told Abraham, I'll make your name great, not your title. People tend to gravitate toward titles because they don't have a good name. Yeah, that's what your credit report gives you. It is a snapshot of your name in the streets. <laughs> when speak, yeah, I'm going to leave it alone. When people speak your name, listen, when people speak your name, what's your, somebody shout your name at me. Yeah, when people speak your name, what comes to their mind? When they speak the name of your church, what do they think of? We want to be known for, yeah, we want to be known for being a church that keeps our promises. Every church is known for something. Some churches are known for being prophetic ministries. And so when you go to that church, they're really into, prof into prophecy and things like that. Some churches are known for being uh, uh, good singers. If you want good singing, go to so-and-so's church. They will sing you into glory. Some churches are good for being known as being revival centers. Some, church some churches are known for being uh, outreach centers. When you, when you go to that church, the culture of that church is all about outreach, evangelism, and all those things are good in their place. But none of those things mean nothing if you're not a church who has a reputation for keeping your word. We want to be known for being a church that keeps our promises. When we say we're going to do something, we do it because that is the nature of our God. Somebody shout amen. amen. Our text revolves around the details regarding what is called the Abrahamic covenant. And the issue is this. God said he would bless Abraham's descendants. And that they would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and that they'd be as numerous as the sand on the seashore. But at the time he told Abraham that, he didn't have not one child. He had no seed. 
So here was God promising him that your name is going to be great, that your descendants are going to be great, that you're going to have so many kids you're not going to be able to count them, that, you're, that, you're, that, that, that your descendants are going, to, are going to be known all over the world. And Abraham said, how are you going to do that? Has anybody ever had God make you a crazy promise? I mean, made you, I mean, made you a promise that was so outrageous that it made you sit back and say, well, God, how are you going to do that? I mean, I mean, I mean, where the honest folks at? I know we're supposed to be people of faith and people of, you know, we believe the word of God. But has anybody ever told you something so impossible that the only way it was ever going to happen is if God did a miracle? If you looked at your bank account, if you looked at your background, if you looked at your education, if you looked at the tools in your tool chest, if you looked at the, at the, at the, at the hole that they pulled you out of, there'd be no way that I should be able to move into that. Have you ever had God promise you something so big that it intimidated you? In fact, it doesn't even excite God until you get on something that intimidates you. Every once in a while, God has to shake you up and just show you something that is way beyond your ability. You know why? Because it makes you have to depend on God. Is there anybody right now, where my witness is at, is there anybody right now who is living in something, driving something, working in something, enjoying something that years ago you thought was impossible? I, I just want to take a poll. I just need a few witnesses that God will bless you. Oh, my God. But when God made this, spoke these words to Abraham at the time, it seemed impossible, not just because he didn't have a seed, but he and his wife were past childbearing age. Now, if you had talked to me about this God when I was 20 or 30, when I was still virile and had my youthful energy, I would have thought it was possible. But I'm darn near 100 years old, and so is my wife. And she's past childbearing age, and now you want to talk to me about what you're going to do through my seed. I want to talk to someone in here who God is speaking to, and you feel like you are past your prime. Like you might have missed your moment. That God, if you had did this when I was 15 or 16 or 20, that I would have believed it. But now I'm 40 and 50, and it still hasn't come to pass, but you're just crazy enough to believe that God's going to do it anyway. I want to talk to somebody here who feels like you missed your moment. That you missed your opportunity. That time has gotten away from you. That you're starting to feel like the, 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 the days on the calendar have gone by and it still hasn't happened. But God is a covenant-keeping God. And if God promises you something, it doesn't matter how long you had to wait. It doesn't matter how, what you had to go through. It doesn't matter who left you, who forsook you, who walked out on you. God said, I'm still going to bring it to pass. Somebody said, it's still going to happen. So God entered into a covenant with Abraham because he knows how we are. When you start comparing what God says he's going to do to what you have to work with, it can make you feel like, God, you, you ain't looking at this right. Do you know who I am? Have you, God, when you called me, did you know what material you had to work with? Do you know what family I come from? Do you, what are you talking about seed? I ain't got seed dust. I ain't got nothing in my tool chest. There is no indication that I'm going to ever become or be what you are calling me to be. And if you're the kind of person who feels like that right now, you are a prime candidate for the glory of God to show up. Because most of the time, God doesn't look for the people who look like it's going to happen. He tries to find the people where it looks like it could never happen. Because if God does it for you, then you have to step back and say, if it had not been for God. See, some of us are glory stealers. You stand up and say, I did this. I made this money. I got this degree. I brought this job. I worked this business. And God has to put things outside of your reach sometime just to prove to you that if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have it. Is there anybody who is thankful in this moment right here who can take 30 seconds and just thank God for what he's done? Come on. With your alcoholic mama and your drug dealing daddy, ain't no way in the world you should have came out as good as you did. But when you look back on the things that God brought you out of, you better take 30 seconds and give God your best praise. With your crazy family and your ripped up background, there's no way you should be as good as you are. But anybody that's glad that God did something in your life, take 30 seconds right here and give him your best praise. I thank you.
But the odds were stacked against Abraham. And so God made a covenant with him. A covenant is simply a contract. It's a binding agreement between two parties. Now look at this. In Bible times, the word covenant, watch me here, it involved promise. Covenant involved faithfulness. Covenant involved loyalty. It involved, here's the word, commitment. Anytime they made a covenant in the Bible times, it involved all those words. They understood it. It's not like today. It's not like today. We make promises all the time that we break. The closest thing we can come to a covenant is, is a contract. You sit down with somebody and you sign and say, I'm going to do this and you're going to do that. But one of the signs of this age, according to, first, according to Romans chapter 1, one of the signs of a reprobate mind, one of the signs of the sinfulness of our nature is that we would be covenant breakers. That men would be covenant breakers. That we would make promises that we don't even keep. And what's worse, we make promises we have no intention of keeping. Even with contracts, we break the contract. We make promises and we don't come through. And what makes that bad for me is one thing for you to not come through with what you promise. But it bothers me on another level is that when you signed it, you intended not to keep it. And that's the sign of our age. That's the sign of our generation. It's normal. We make promises all the time that we don't do. Listen, promises are created to give us a sense of security. Because it's hard to have a healthy relationship, a business relationship, a romantic relationship with anybody who's operating from a position of insecurity. And if you've ever tried it, you know it is frustrating. If you've ever been in a relationship with somebody who is deeply insecure, you know it is frustrating as you can be. <laughs> oh my God. It's a prison for them. It's a prison for them, but it's also hell for you. Because when you're involved with somebody who's deeply insecure, nothing you say makes them comfortable. When you make a promise, it's designed to make you calm down, relax. Whoo, they made a promise, I'm good. But when you're dealing with somebody who's deeply insecure, no matter what you say to them, they're never going to be settled. They're never going to be secure. They're never going to be happy. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, it is frustrating for them. They're not happy with you. You're not happy with them. And it's all because you are insecure. You can't date an insecure person. And for God's sake, don't marry an insecure person. If you are married to an insecure person, it'll make you feel like you're in a, a, long, a lifelong prison sentence. You can't go to the bathroom and say, what you doing in the bathroom? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just got off the plane a few hours ago. Michael, I'm tired. See? Yeah, you can't go to the corner store. You can't do anything because they're deeply insecure. And it's hard to have peace and it's hard to enjoy. Here it is, God. It's hard to enjoy the relationship to the fullest extent because the trust level is not there. Either they have proven or they have not proven yet that they will keep their word. And so even though they tell you things they're going to do for you, you never rest in it. You're never comfortable in it because you are insecure. And if God is going to do something in your life, one of the things he wants you to be as a child of God is secure in his word. People have taught us that they don't mean what they say. Because they've broken their promises, they're truth breakers, they're covenant breakers. But God is trying to train us to be people that when I say something, you can count on it. When I say something, I'm going to make sure that I keep, I will keep my word to you. Now, the reason why nobody's excited about that right now is because you're thinking about people who promised you things that they didn't do. And you think people, you think God is like people. Yeah, you think about your last boyfriend, you think about your last employer, you think about your neighbor, you think about people you did business with, and when I say there's a promise being made to you, you conjure up all these broken promises that have been made to you, that you have had with men and with women, and the unfortunate thing is you try to take the attributes and behavior of men, and you place it on God, and God says, I'm not like your last boyfriend. I'm not like your mama. I'm not like your daddy. If I say something, it shall 
come hell or high water, it shall come to pass because I'm God. And even if it wasn't what you thought it was, it shall be. I will call those things that are not as though they were. Like I told you last week, my word shall not come back to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I sent it out to do. God says, if I put my, if I give you a word right now, some of you are living under a prophecy right now. And God says, if I give you a word concerning your life, you can put your faith in it. You can trust in it because I'm God. And if I have to, I will move heaven and earth just to make sure I keep my word to you. Because. I want you to know that you can trust me. I don't know. I can't get off this point because God is trying to tell somebody right now, you can trust me. I got you, dog. I don't care what they said about you. I don't care what's set up against you. I don't care what the odds are. I got you. If I tell you you are the head and not the tail, I got you. If I step in a hospital room and I said that you're going to be healed, you shall be healed. I don't care what the doctor's report say. I don't care what the sugar level is. I don't care what your cholesterol is. I don't care what your high blood pressure is. If I step into your hospital room and I said you are healed, you are healed by the power of God. Where my witness is, is God ever blessed somebody to get healing when the doctor said it's not possible? Sit down, let me go so far. One of the most, so what they would do is, uh, they would do like covenant ceremonies, right? And one of the most notable covenant ceremonies was what they call a blood path covenant. And what that would involve is walking in between slaughtered animals. They would take the animals and they would slaughter them, cut them in half, and put them both, put them one on each side. And when they made a, a covenant or an agreement with somebody, the people would walk between the pieces, the bloody pieces, the cut pieces, the torn pieces. And what they were basically saying is, let this happen to me if I don't keep my word. That was a blood covenant. As you see these torn pieces, these ripped pieces, let the same thing happen to me that has happened to these animals if I don't keep my word. That's something that they would do to make a covenant. It's pretty serious, right? So look, so look at this. While they walk between the pieces, they would make an oath. So here I am, Mark, and I'm walking between these bloody pieces, and I'm saying, okay, let this happen. But I'm also making an oath. I'm making a swear. I'm swearing, saying, I swear to do X, Y, Z. Right? Remember when we was kids, and we would say, uh, I swear to God? I know we shouldn't, but we'd say that. We would swear. We'd basically be saying, you can keep my word. I'm going to keep my word. Uh, and what they would do is they would swear by something greater than themselves. So they would say something like, I swear if I don't keep my word, you can have my truck. I swear by my, I swear if I don't do what I say I'm going to do, you can take my house. Oh, I swear that if I don't, if I don't do what I say I'm going to do, you can come get the car. What we're basically saying is you can, you can count on me losing whatever it is I promise if I don't keep my word, right? So they would swear by something greater than themselves or something that they don't own, or something they don't have sometimes because they're saying, if I don't keep my word, then you can have whatever it is. The problem was when God got ready to make a covenant with Abraham, he, he looked around and I, he said, I, I can't find anything greater than myself to swear by. <laughs> typically, you know, you find something that was greater than yourself to swear by, but God said, I, I can't find anybody. I can't find anything greater than me to swear by. So if you read the story in Genesis, you find where Abraham went to sleep, and in his sleep, God walked down between the pieces, and he made a promise to himself that he would keep his word to Abraham. And what God is saying to you today is that I made a promise to myself with myself that I would do whatever I did whatever I'm going to do in your life see the problem is when God makes a promise with a man your frailties make it hard to make a covenant with you typically when people come to a covenant we're, we're kind of equal we both have something to lose but God says I have everything you don't have anything so I can't come into a covenant 
a binding agreement with you because you don't have anything. And what you got belong to me. <laughs> your house, your car, it's mine anyway. What you got to negotiate with? So God said, I'm going to make a promise with myself that I will keep my word. Now here, I, want you to, I don't want you to get lost in the theology of that, but what I want you to understand is this. When God wanted to significantly impact Abraham's life, he did it by, giving him the, by, by talking to him about the unchanging nature of his promise. I want you to know that my promises are unchanging. That if I say something to you, I'm going to do it, it doesn't change. So that you could be secure. So here's a couple of takeaways I want you to take from this. First of all, loyalty trumps talent. Loyalty trumps talent. We, we have put so much emphasis on people's gifts and abilities that we've raised a generation of people who are hooked on talent. In fact, we will excuse their erratic behavior as long as they can sing or preach or play or whatever it is that we like. And whenever you have talent but no loyalty, you're like the cow that gives good milk, but you always kick it over. Don't let you chew on that. Whenever you have talent but you have no loyalty, you're like somebody, when you're here, you're good. The problem is that you're not here. Some, some of you get into relationships like that. You, you are carried away with people because they're cute. But cute don't always pay bills. Let me look under these lights. Cute don't always come home. Cute is not always, I'm not saying you can't be cute and dependable, but I'm saying that if, all you, if your only qualification is cute, then you're going to be frustrated. Because what you want is somebody who's committed. You can be cute all day, cute, fine as wine, shapely and everything. But if I got to chase you around, what good is that for me? Michael, Michael, Mike's always laughing at me. Yeah, he got big bulge and muscles and everything, but he don't come home. You walk on the floor at night, 3 o'clock in the morning, looking out the window. What you want is commitment. I would rather have you be mediocre, but you're committed. Yeah, okay, you're going to shout me down. If, listen, look at this. If you don't stick, you don't matter. If you don't stick, you don't matter. One of the promises God made to Israel is that he, was, he would heal her backsliding ways. The word backslide means you don't adhere, you don't stay, you don't stick. You lack stickiness. If you're truly going to make a lasting impact on this community, you have to be able to stick. What we need are sticky people. Not cute people. Not fancy people. Not just talented people. We need sticky people. You flying around everywhere. You're at this church. You're at that church. You're at this thing and at that thing. You're like a fly buzzing around. You don't stick nowhere. When I was a kid, they used to have fly paper, Connie. And the fly paper, the flies be flying all around, flying all around, flying all around. But when they get on that fly paper, they stick. What we need is some sticky people who can get in something and stay in something and don't brag. See, this generation brags about moving around all the time. We, I just move here and I just go there and I just be a part of this and I just be a part of that. But they don't stick nowhere. And you are like a rolling stone that sees excitement, but you don't gather no moss. You don't stick with nothing. You don't stick anywhere. You don't stick long enough to make a contribution. You don't stick long enough to make a real impact. You're here today and you're going tomorrow. You're here today. What we need are some sticky people. And when you're not a sticky person, you have no relational or social equity because you don't stick. You just don't stick. You're good at what you do, but you don't stick. And I'd rather have mediocre talent that sticks than to have great talent, but you're never available. Talent can be developed. Dependability is a character issue. And the insecurity that ensues when you don't know what a person's going to do is excruciating. The Bible says in Proverbs that confidence in an unfaithful man is like a broken tooth. Or a foot out of joint. Ever had a broken tooth? 
Ever been afraid to, bow, to bite down? Ever been afraid to eat? I'm starving. I want to eat, but I can't because this tooth. If I bite down this tooth, it's going to send shockwaves through my whole body. And I'd rather not eat than to be in pain. Ever, anybody ever sprained your foot? Typically, you somebody that can move pretty quick. But when you got a sprained foot, you don't move as quickly. You don't want to put no weight on it. Therefore, you sit because you don't want to put no weight on it. Some people in our lives are just that way. You can't put weight on them. Because if you put weight on them, if you try to depend on them, they're going to always let you down. Every time. Oh, she sings good, but you can't have to depend on her. Oh, he preaches like Paul, but I don't know if he's going to be here or not. Oh, when he's here, he's the bomb diggity, but I'm not sure if they're going to come. And it's frustrating, and you can't get mad at people when you've taught them what to expect from you. You know that's true. There are certain people in your family, you know if you call Mary, she is not going to do it. Don't even call in Mary to say, bring the potato salad to the family reunion. Because every time, she'd be the first one to say, I'll bring the potato salad, but she'd never bring it. <laughs> don't call Jim for a ride to work because you know he's not going to come. And if he do come, he's going to be two hours late. And now you're going to fight because you're late. And my question is, when people show you who they are, why do you keep thinking for, looking for something else? Don't get mad if I don't include you. Don't get mad if I don't call you. Don't get mad if I don't consult with you because you've already taught me what to expect from you. So think about our church in this community. What are we teaching people to expect from us? What are we teaching people to expect? If, if we're people who continue to make promises or we make promises and we don't keep them, we can't impact the people that we've been sent to impact. We can't touch, we can't train, we can't help because we've already taught them, don't expect them to be there. They said they're coming, but they ain't coming. They said they're going to help, but they're not going to help. They said they're going to make a difference, but they're not going to make a difference. And if we're going to be people who make a real impact, we got to be people who say something and we do it. Somebody say do it. Here's what I know. If you have a bad reputation, it's not that it can't be overcome, but it has to be overcome over time. You got to do something and continue to do it until you convince the person that you have messed up that I am who I say I am. So it's not the first thing you do. It's not the second thing you do. It's not the third thing you do. It may be the fifth or sixth thing you do until you finally start changing people's minds about you. But that only becomes because you do it, you said it, and you do it. How many have ever had the frustration of somebody promising you something they didn't do it? How mad did it make you? How disgusted did it make you? And when you saw him, you ain't saying nothing about it. He's looked at him like, okay, yeah. God has sent us to impact this area. And they're not going to be impacted because you're excited. They're going to be impacted because you keep your word. They're used to people saying things that they don't do. How are you going to be any different than anybody else? If you say lofty things and make great promises and you don't keep them. So write this down. Write this down. I'm almost done. I got three things I want to help you with this. Number one, only make promises after you've counted the cost. Jesus said nobody going to war goes to war without counting the cost. Nobody starts a house, building a house without seeing if they have enough money to build the project. The problem with us is we don't want to have a reputation for starting projects that we don't finish. If you start something, finish it. Look at somebody say, finish it. If you start, we have a reputation of having things half done, half finished. We commit the stuff and don't get it done. And nothing wrong with having multiple projects, but finish one. Make priorities to finish one before you move to the next thing. If you keep starting things and not finishing and starting things and don't do it and starting things and don't finish it, pretty soon you got a room full of stuff that you started and didn't finish. And how is that going to bring glory to God if you keep promising you're going to be there for people and you don't do it? 
You know what happens? We're quick to say yes to everything without considering what it will require from you. Every good idea is not a God idea. The only things you should commit to are the things that are consistent with your core values. If you know that's not really who you are, then stop saying yes to it. Stop. It tickles me, Daphne, the number of people that you say, I want you to be involved in children's ministry. And they say, yes, I will. And then they don't show up. Because you just said yes because you was excited or yes because the person in front of you was excited, but you didn't even follow through and do what you said you were going to do. And it's frustrating. Oh, I got one amen. I got one amen. I'm sorry. I must be stepping on some toes up in here, Michael. I'm, I thought it was going to be a shouting message, but they sitting down like I'm sitting on a record. That they got a rock sitting on top of them. We get excited. Yeah, we're going to do it. But then you don't show up. You know what it is? Because sometimes when you said yes, you have not sat down and counted what it would cost. There's a cost to serving people. There's a cost to being available. There's a cost to being impactful. You have not sat down and figured out how I could be, I could make myself available. This is what I found out. People make time for the things they're passionate about. Thank you. I finally said something. I got to listen. People, people talk about they ain't got time, and they, they ain't got time. They just have not prioritized you. People make time for people that they want to be bothered with. I don't care how busy you are. You ain't that busy. You ain't that busy. You got to eat sometime. You got to sleep sometime. You got to go to bed from sometime. You got to get in the car sometime. Tell me I ain't got time. Sure you had time. You just didn't, you just didn't prioritize it. And sometimes you get involved with things, but you have not prioritized it. You just said yes, but you haven't counted what it would cost to fulfill that yes. Which means that you may have to move your life around just to keep your word. Oh, you don't want to do that. You want to let it fit conveniently into your schedule. But I'm going to tell somebody something. Serving God in ministry is not convenient. Do you hear what I said? I said, ministry is, thank you, young man, ministry is not convenient. It ain't what God said. Well, if you get time and you get around to it and it fits in your schedule, no, you prioritize service. You prioritize the people of God. You move your schedule around. All of us can find something else to do. I move some stuff around so I could be available. And if you're not going to be available, stop making promises before you counted the cost. I'd rather you say, well, Pastor, let me get back to you about that. I had somebody say that to me one time, Pastor, uh, let me get back to you about that. Uh, it's three years now. I'm still waiting. <laughs> they could have said no, and I would have moved on to somebody else. But they said, let me get back to you. Three years later, I'm still waiting on an answer. You know what it is? They really meant no. But because they didn't have the nerve to say no, they said, let me pray about it. You know how the saints do. Let me pray about it. Let me pray about it. I appreciate our, our, our music director because when I first asked her to, to take on that assignment, she didn't give me a quick answer. She said, let me pray about it. She did. She, did. she, did. she didn't say, oh, my God, I would love to do it, and I'm just going to do this, and I'm just going to do that. She said, let me pray about it. And you know what she did? She really did pray about it. Some of y'all say, I pray about it, but you ain't thought about it since the last time I asked you. I ain't thought no more about that. <laughs> Yeah, I just went on about my business. I ain't even crossed, crossed my mind. But she really did pray about it. A couple weeks later, when I talked to her, she said, I prayed about it. And God released me to do it. But I respected that because at least you took the time to count the cost. What frustrates me is not you saying no. What frustrates me is you saying yes and don't do it. What frustrates our community is when we as a church say we're going to do something and then we don't do it. It'd be better not to commit than to say we're going to do it and we don't. Second thing, second thing, second thing. Always under promise, but over deliver. It's always a good thing when somebody does more than they promise. If somebody went above and beyond what they promised 
or what I expected is a good thing. I went to McDonald's the other day, and I asked for a small fry. They gave me supersized fries. I said, thank you. Because <laughs> that was a good thing. Yeah. It's always a good thing when somebody comes in promising you down here, but they give you way up over here. I mean, I thought you was going to bless me, but you just overwhelmed me with blessing. That's a good thing. But what we do is we overpromise and we underdeliver. We come with big, lofty promises about the things we're going to do and the things we're going to say, and I'm going to be here, and I'm going to, and then you don't do it. Always, always under promise, but over deliver. When you under promise and you over deliver, it makes you seem so much greater. Because you went past what I thought. I'll never forget last year, we was getting ready to do an outdoor event. And, I, and, and, and uh, Titus and them committed to say, you know, we're going to put a stage up outside and it's going to be nice. And I thought, oh, okay, it'll be nice. And in my mind, I had this little stage, you know, you know, maybe about five by five. With a little umbrella out there, Mark, and I'm just out there in the mic just preaching. Good old storefront preaching outside. When I pulled around the corner and I saw this great big grand stage with the lighting and the backlights and the back screens and all that, I thought, well, Lord, I was blown away. I still stood back and just grinned at it like, oh, my God. I was just cheesing all over myself, Trina, because I was like, oh, my God, that's what I'm talking about. Where you underpromise, but you overdeliver, that's a good thing. We as a church want to be a people who surprise this community with what we will do. You thought you was getting a bag lunch? No, nah, babe, I'm bringing you a whole box. You thought I was just coming to fix a window? I'm going to fix the window, the door, the porch. Come on, when our worship team gets up, we ain't just going to sing songs you heard. We're going to sing stuff you ain't never seen before, and the power of God's going to fall on you, and God's going to take us to a whole other level. I want to over-deliver. Look, so I say over-deliver. Last thing, I'm almost done. Last thing is this. Always be willing to recommit to your promises. Now, here's where a lot of people mess up. Here's a word that we learned over, over the coronavirus. One word, pivot. If we ain't learned nothing else, the virus last year taught us the power of pivot. Pivot means that I change. I move. I was expecting this. I know it goes this way, but I pivoted. I changed because the circumstances have changed. I haven't changed my direction. I just changed how I'm going to get there. So I can still keep my word. I got ready, to get some, got ready to go somewhere last week, and uh, I normally time it so I get to a certain place at a certain time, and I, I time it on how fast we get there, but I fooled around Mark and ran into traffic, and the traffic had it backed up for miles, and according to my GPS, it would have took me at least 45 minutes to an hour to get to the thing that I was trying to get to, and I should have been there in like 10, 15 minutes, but instead of getting upset and going home forgetting about it, I put my tracker in my GPS, and it gave me an alternate route. So I can still meet my obligation. I just found another way to do it. Some of you, you let every little thing derail you. Everything messes you up. Everything makes you not keep your word. But if you're going to be a committed person, we're just going to find another way to do it. Do you hear what I said? It's not that we're not going to do it. We're just going to find another way to do it. We're going to find another way to get help to you, to get aid to you. We're going to impact you. Listen, I can't come around this way, but I'm going to come around this way, but I'm still going to do what I said I'm going to do. That's what's got most of you messed up with God. Because God doesn't come the way you thought, you think he's not going to do it. But God says, I may not come the way you want me to. And I may not come when you want me to. But I'm always going to be right on time. And the blessing may not come through the person you thought was going to come through. But I'm still going to bless you anyway. So he left you, but I'm still going to bless you anyway. So she walked out, but I'm still going to bless you anyway. So they fired you, but I'm still going to get a blessing to you anyway. It may not come from this job. It may not come from this church. It may not come from this man. It may not come from this woman. But bless God, it will come. Somebody said it will come. God says, I don't quit. I don't get frustrated. If the devil blocks me here, I'm going to come another way. 
I was I, I went out I went out of town this week this weekend is what I did, and I, I I made a promise to a dear friend of mine that I was coming, who was dealing with grief. I said I'm coming. When I heard the voice on the phone, I just said, Mike, I just said, Mark, I said, I'm coming. That was it. When I got ready to go, I took this flight last minute, and I swear, it was an ordeal. What well, should have taken an hour and a half to get there, no lie, took me 18 hours. Between delays <laughs> and cancellation, by the time Deacon Green dropped me off at 1 o'clock, I didn't get to my destination till like 8 o'clock the next day. The next day. It was delayed, then it was canceled, then we got to another city, it was delayed again, it was canceled, I'm laying on the, on the, on the chairs in the, in, the, in the airport, people are mad, people are frustrated, and listen, everything in me wanted to say, I'm going home. I started looking at the rental car, I think we just drive my car and go home. And I started to call my friend and let them know, hey, you know, I got delayed, you know, things happened, I couldn't make it, and they would have understood. They would have understood. Couldn't make it. I mean, this, this got canceled, that got canceled, the engine was bad, something about bad weather, I don't know, I don't think I'll make it this time, but I'll call you, I love you. I could have called them, Mark, and told them that, and they would have understood it. But I didn't do it. Because I wanted to keep my word. I could have used every excuse in the world, and it would have been legitimate. The airport closed, they canceled, the flight got delayed, X, Y, Z. I could have given all kinds of reasons not to come. But it was important to me that I kept my word. I was late, but I was there. I was tired, I was hungry. Mark, I was dusty. But when I landed in the city, I just texted him and said, I'm here. I need some people in this church who don't use every excuse not to show up. What we need are some people who step over excuses. When you got people waiting on you to serve them and you're giving excuses, you look crazy. Well, my dog ate my cat and my shoe wasn't hurting and my corn was hurting on my little toe and I couldn't find my matching pantyhose. And you know what? My show came on. This was the last time. And you make all these excuses. But I need some people who say, you know what? I fu-. In fact, I don't even need you to tell me what you went through. I got there. I did not tell him one moment what I went through. All I said was, I'm here. I didn't talk about the airline. I didn't talk about the airport. I didn't complain about the crook in my neck. I didn't say I was tired. I was hungry. I showed up and I said, I'm here. Is there anybody that has the kind of commitment that says, I'm here? I'm here. Let that devil know I'm here. Let that devil know I'm going to show up. Let that devil know I'm here for the fight. I'm here. I'm here. Stop making excuses for behavior. Look at somebody say, I'm here. I had to fight my way, but I'm here. I had to drag myself up by the bootstraps, but I'm here. I had to struggle and get out of bed, but I'm here. Somebody shout, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Let every devil know I'm here. Let every demon know I'm here. Let every community know I'm here. I had to cry, but I'm here, Mark. I had to fight, but I'm here. I had to walk through a fire, but I'm here. I had to go another way, but I'm here. Get away from me with all these excuses for why you can't be here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Let the devil know I'm here. And since I'm here, I'm going to praise you. You fought me. You tried to shut me down. You tried to talk about me, but I'm still here. You ran my name down in the street. You said I wasn't going to make it, but I'm here. I had to cry my way through it. I had to stretch my way through it. I had to drag myself by one foot, but I'm here. Ah! You got a right to praise him. You got a right to praise him. All the stuff you've been doing, I'm still here. High five somebody in the air and say, I'm still here. I'm still here. 
I went through a divorce, but I'm here. I lost my job, but I'm here. I had to go to the hospital, but I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Look, Carmen, I went to this restaurant one time, and uh, I was hungry, and it was right, you know, right in the midst of all the corona stuff was going on, and there were different restaurants that were closing and not opening and all that. I went to this restaurant one time, and it had the lights on, and I was hungry, see, and I wanted to get something to eat. And when I walked in, the only person that was there was the manager. And, I, and he says, sir, we can't serve you today. And I said, why not? Your door's open. The light's on. And he said, we can't serve you today because our waiters didn't show up. Our kitchen staff didn't show up. The people that we hired to serve you didn't show up. So the lights are on, the door's open, but I really got to apologize to you because we can't serve you. And I walked away and thought to myself, I wonder if that's how church is. When, when hurting people show up, when broken people show up, when families show up needing ministry, do we have people who are sitting at home making excuses for why you can't serve? Talking about you don't like the music. I don't like the sound. I don't like the heat. And you got all these reasons why you can't be in position. And you want God to be faithful to you. And you can't be faithful to him. And he's sending people in our midst who need ministry, who need word, who need deacons, who need elders, who need prayer warriors, but they can't get served because you ain't there. The devil is a liar. Look at somebody say, I'm here. I'm here if they don't come. I'm here if nobody shows up. I'm in position. I am ready to serve. I am on my post because I plan to make a difference. Look at somebody say, make a difference. Let me close with this. One of the imageries of somebody who is backslidden is, is, is a beast of burden who sits back on his hunches. He normally carries things on his back, but he gets stubborn, see, and he sits back on his hunches. And when he sits back on his hunches, whatever he's carrying on his back slides off. And some of you have been so stubborn with God that he can't use you in a significant way because you're sitting back on your hunches. You want blessing, but you don't want service. You want God to open doors, but you don't want to make yourself available. And so God said, I need somebody who'll be faithful enough to carry the burden of ministry because I'm sending souls your way. I'm sending families your way. I'm sending kids your way. I'm sending women your way. I'm sending broken women your way. And I don't want you to be so stubborn that I can't get up off your hunches. Get up! So I lift your hands and say, God, you can use me. You can use me. I'm not perfect, but you can use me. I'm not special, but you can use me. I'm not educated, but you can use me. I'm not the prettiest, but you can use me. I'm not the smartest, but you can use me. How God going to use you sitting down? How God going to use you when every time he depends on you, you make every excuse for you not being available? Well, I had something to do. Well, my job, get out of here. You make time for everything else you want to do. You made time for that man that was mistreating you all the time. You made time for that fast woman when she was spending all your money. Now you ain't got time for God. Somebody throw your hands up and say, Lord, I'm available. I'm available. I'm available. God said, I got a power coming to you. All I need you to do is commit. Pick a lane. Pick a lane. Shoot past a dribble. Do something. You ever been behind somebody in, in, in a car on the highway and, and Daphne, they sitting on both sides of the lane? You're not in this lane, you're not in this lane. And the whole thing is all frustrated because you can't figure out which side you're going to be on. I don't care what side you pick on, you sit on, just pick a lane. When you pick a lane, we can go forward. When you pick a lane, we can get something done. Get out of my way and pick a lane. 
sit on the side of the road, park your car if you want to, but get out of my way because I'm trying to go somewhere. Look at somebody shout, pick a lane. Pick a lane. Stop sitting on the fence. Stop being two-timing. Stop being two-faced. Stop being on this side and that side. Get in the lane and stick with it. Woo! Oh my God. Somebody's life is depending on you picking a lane. Somebody's family is depending on you picking a lane. Lift your hands over here and say, God, I'm going to pick a lane. I'm going to pick a lane. I'm going to pick a I'm, I'm, I'm gonna find a, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to get where I'm supposed to be. I'm going to get in position. I'm going to throw off all these excuses. Talking about just because I ain't in the church, I'm still serving the kingdom. The devil's a lie. The devil is a lie. We need some sticky people. We're not going to make a difference if people, here's the judgment that we'll win judgment in danger of. If people come in our doors and the singers are not in place and the preachers are not in place and the deacons are not in place and the greeters are not in place and the media people are not in place and the band is not in place and you got hungry people coming in our doors and they can't be saved because the people who were called to serve have not committed to impacting through commitment. Lift your hands right here. Lift your hands right here. Let me pray for you. For somebody, the first commitment you need to make is to God. To give yourself to God. No, 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 no. Not your talent. Not your gift. We don't need your singing. We don't need your preaching. We don't need you playing. The first thing you need is make a commitment to your God. Your soul is on the line. I appreciate the fact you can sing. That's nice. But what's more important to me is that you have a relationship with God. Lift your hands right here. Recommit. 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 I know you got a constitution and you've committed to a certain path, but they even make amendments to the constitution when it's necessary. Still going to get there. I'm going to commit. Haven't been in church in months, but I'm going to recommit. Haven't served God like I'm supposed to. I got into some mess just last night, but I'm going to recommit. If that's you, lift your hand and begin to worship the Lord right here. Lift your hands and worship him right here. Right here. Use me, Lord. Use me to make a difference. I'm just crazy enough to think that you could use me. If you're watching me online, you need to recommit to your God. Recommit to your God, to your relationship with God. This is the time. God wants to use you in a significant way and you're busy making excuses and all the reasons why you can't do it and you can't be available. But I'm recommitting today. Perhaps you're here today and you've just been watching church online and watching church and ducking in and out of churches and I've been to this church and I've been to that church and I'm shopping. You shop in churches like you shopping for shoes. Stick somewhere. Stick somewhere. Everybody stand to your feet all over the building. If you're in here today and, and maybe you're a visitor, maybe you've been coming for a while and you need to commit yourself to a church. I need a place to get my family together, to get my life right, get my kids right, get my marriage right. And you want the Victory Church to be your church? Just wave your hand at me and say, I want to make this church my church. Wherever you are, wherever you are, wherever you are, there's one, there's one, somebody else, somebody else. The doors of the church are open. I'm going to get myself in position. Somebody else, somebody bring your whole family, bring your kids, bring your husband. You say, well, Lord, I got to get myself right. God said, you ain't got to get it right. Just come right here and I'll fix everything you're trying to get right. It's time to pick a lane. It's time to pick a lane. If you're watching me online, if you're watching me online and you need some place to commit, just you can go to our website and there's information there that you become an e-member. Just because you're not in this building don't mean that we can't commit ourselves to pastoring you and ministering to you and serving you. We have made that commitment to you. We're going to impact your life through our commitment to you. 
to change your life, to change the life of your family, to preach God's word, to worship until the power of God falls in your life. Somebody give God praise all over this building.